You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. If we were able to address just that one thing, which is to put down social engineering and phishing, it would get rid of 70 to 90 percent of all cybersecurity risk, just fixing one thing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hacking Humans podcast brought to you by N2K Cyberwire. This is the show where every week we delve into the world of social engineering scams, phishing plots and criminal activities that are grabbing headlines and causing significant harm to organizations all over the world. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hey, Joe. Hi, Dave. we got some good stories to share this week. And later in the show, Roger Grimes, data-driven defense evangelist at Know Before. We're talking about his new book, Fighting Fishing, everything you can do to fight social engineering and fishing. But first, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. Where would InfoSec professionals be without users making security mistakes? Working less than 60 hours per week, perhaps. Actually having a weekend every so often. We get it. User behavior can be a challenge. But users can also be an InfoSec professional's greatest asset once properly equipped. What do we mean by that? Well, stay with us, and in a few minutes... We'll hear from our sponsors at Know Before on that very question. All right, Joe, before we jump into our stories here, we have a little bit of feedback. Uh, I'll I'll lead things off for us here. Uh, Someone named Tim wrote in and said... Uh, Gents, thought you might be interested in me almost getting snagged today. Mm. Recently, I transferred investment assets from one financial firm to another. A few unique shares were non-transferable, and my financial advisor alerted me that I'd get a reach out from my former account giving me next steps to liquidate those shares and resolve the issues. Well, I got the letter. It provides an 888 number to call. In my haste, I entered 800 instead. Interesting. Not paying attention to the automated opening, because who pays attention to the automated opening? I heard the name of the company I was trying to call, and then what I thought was an old promotional offer for households that had someone over 50 years of age. I opted for the negative option, as no one in my house has yet hit 50, but even so, it pushed me through to a very well-spoken and eager woman who, without pausing for breath, outlined a promotional opportunity for a medical alert fall device, the old... I've fallen and I can't get up. The promotion, I said, I'm sorry, but I must have hit the wrong button. No one in my house is over 50. Without a moment of hesitation, she moved to the next part of her script. That's okay. There's still a chance that someone in your house could fall. I guess there's always a chance that someone in your house could fall. Right? (laughs) It's important to make sure you have a device in case of emergency. Let's get some more information. At that point, I hung up and redialed. The automated answer now was a completely different recording. Look at the number versus my call history. I realized my mistake. The 888 number is the real company. The 800 number was a scam looking to take advantage of people who were trying to call their financial institution. These people. Yeah. <laughs> so, These people. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. I, that's maddening that that even happens like that. Yeah. I mean, they're using the name of the company as well. Yeah. So I think he should be telling somebody at the at his former financial institution's security uh, organization about this and say, hey, someone's squatting on a phone number and that looks like your phone number. You should probably try to go out and seize it. Yeah, that's true. Because I guess Tim does know the number. Right. Because he knows the right number. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I mentioned once on the show that there's something similar to this happened to me where I dialed the number on the back of one of my credit cards, a physical credit card I took out of my wallet <laughs> to call the credit right. card company. You'd think that would be okay. Yeah. But somehow I fat-fingered the number mm-hmm. and got somebody else who, sure enough, was pretending to be the credit card company. Yep. So they gobbled up, I guess, the numbers on either side of that number or, you know, whatever. They figured out how people most are most likely to fat-finger it. Yep. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think that these, if they're if they're saying that they are the company that you're trying to call, that I think that those companies who are being spoofed here uh, have good cause for yeah. going after these people. It's just hard when it's international. 
Uh, yeah, you know, it is. I mean, but, you know, you can get the number locally. You can call the phone company and go, somebody's using this. Give me the phone number. If they're saying this is my number, give it to me. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got one other bit of, uh, of feedback here, Joe. You want to uh, yeah, read it for us? This one came from an, an anonymous user, or listener, uh -huh. not user, but listener, who said, uh, someone keeps impersonating me on LinkedIn, and I cannot get LinkedIn to do anything about this. Hmm. Uh, I am not surprised. By that. No. Uh, I have I have an idea who's doing this, but I cannot get LinkedIn to get moving. So I, you know, I'm thinking about this. And Dave, I'm I got nothing on this because <laughs> if you if if you have a problem with LinkedIn impersonating things, unless you have a ton of money and can go out and buy a uh, service like like Zero Fox offers, um, you know, if you're a high net worth individual, you have that money and you have that capability. Uh, they can go out, they have a, a relationship with them, but if you're just a regular person, like you and me, yeah. I mean, even though we are podcast famous, <laughs> uh, and, and this person who reached out to me, uh, I don't know what can be done here about this. Because if you talk to LinkedIn, you are essentially screaming into the void, as I like to say. Yeah. They are just another big pile of garbage social media company. <laughs> Don't hold back, Joe. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, and, and it's getting Today's worse, Today's episode Dave. not brought to you by LinkedIn. Right. It's getting, <laughs> it's getting worse. I, I will say this. I will say this. I started seeing a bunch of political posts on LinkedIn, oh. which I think is something that is profoundly stupid to do. Okay. It doesn't matter what side you're on in the political spectrum. Don't yeah. put political stuff on LinkedIn. Yeah. You're alienating somebody, and that's really not what you want to do on LinkedIn. Well, uh, I agree with you, but I think the problem is, or or maybe what uh, caused this, is that with the demise of Twitter, people, a lot of people looked to LinkedIn as uh, the next place for them to do their social media. That's a terrible idea. Go back to go back to Twitter <laughs> and yell into that void. Uh, you know, that's that's what you do. Uh, yeah. Don't don't. Destroy your 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 network, you know your your business network. That's probably one of the most valuable assets you have. Anyway, I digress. Anyway, I found that you could you could block political content on LinkedIn. Oh, and that's once that's I good. did that, I found that was very effective. Okay, well, that's um, good. So LinkedIn does a good job there, but they are apparently not doing a good job uh, with fraudulent accounts. So if anybody has any idea, we would love for uh, anybody who knows how to penetrate the bureaucracy at LinkedIn, right. or if there's any tools that that are out there that are uh, low cost or free of charge, I would love to know about them. Yeah, I wonder if there's some kind of magical incantation, like a, right. like a word you can use to to get their attention or where they they cannot uh, ignore you. <laughs> there's, you know? uh, there's, there's four words you can use. Class action lawsuit. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking uh, like... Uh, Either um, I live in the European Union, that might be one. Right. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, it's dark, more dark, I would say child sexual abuse material. Ah. You know, that would get their attention, but then, you know. Yeah, you don't want to be lying. the one that cries wolf. <laughs> right, exactly. Especially with that wolf. No, but I, I think, yeah. Hmm. And, but you know what? I was thinking about this when uh, before the show. I was looking over our show notes, and I was thinking about this very thing. And I think this is... Part of the problem with again these huge companies, um, if this were a company that was just doing business in my state, right, or had its headquarters in my state, or dare I say was even a company that ran at a human scale, I would say you could call your state's attorney's office or your state's you know division of consumer affairs, right. And maybe get some relief from them. Get them involved. Um, you know, it's like uh, our our pal Mallory Safaste uh, right. at our local you know news affiliate to to be able to to take some action on this. But you can't. There's no way to do that with a company at a global scale. Right. It, it, it's really frustrating. It is. Yeah. It's really. Fr it is terribly frustrating. Yeah. Well, uh, good luck to our listener. Uh, and like Joe said, if somebody knows the the secret to getting some action here. We would love to hear it, and we will share it. Yep. All right. Well, we would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to consider for the show, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. 
Joe, I'm going to start us off with our stories this week, and I have good news. Good news, everyone. <laughs> so finally, because <laughs> my my story is not good news. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll have that to look forward to. Yes. Uh, so there was a international global law enforcement operation that took down uh, an organization called Lab Host. Hmm. And LabHost was a phishing-as-a-service platform. So this was uh, an organization where, let's say you uh, fancy yourself a cyber criminal. Let's say I do. And you've decided that <laughs> phishing is how you're going to do your dastardly deeds. That's right. Very you lucrative. Could, Why wouldn't I do this? <laughs> right. You could reach out to LabHost, and you could buy their services. You could buy a subscription because everything's a subscription now, Joe. Right. You could buy a subscription and they would uh, offer you phishing kits that would let you do the things you needed to do, impersonate things like North American banks, you know, hmm. all that sort of thing. And so they would basically provide all of the behind the scenes infrastructure for hosting your phishing pages, for sending out the phishing emails, and everything you need. Basically, a turnkey solution to do this sort of thing. Um, so as we're recording this, just in the past couple days, Europol with uh, uh, partners all over the world took this organization down. They nice. arrested 37 people. Um, they said that they have uncovered 40,000 phishing domains with 10,000 users worldwide. So um, there are, so are 10,000 people out there Doing that were customers of these these guys. That's how I read this. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, their real time phishing management tool was named Labrat. Labrat. Write your own joke. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, it evidently could bypass multi factor authentication. Australia took down uh, over two hundred servers. Uh, the folks in the UK who I believe led this effort, they arrested four people. Um, they say that LabHost uh, earned uh, about $1.1 million from subscriptions and that they were responsible for the theft of 480,000 credit cards, 64,000 pins, and over a million passwords. Hmm. So, you know, I don't... It's hard to know what the global scale of these sorts of things are and yeah. whether or not this is going to make a dent. I'm going to say that these numbers are probably low. Yeah. That they, they probably cracked or are responsible for more than uh, half a million credit cards and, and one million passwords. Yeah, that's uh, I'm going to say that that's... Because uh, they have amassed over $1.17 million in... These are presumably subscriptions. Right, exactly. Right? From 10,000 people. Yeah, and they've been in business since 2021, so about three years. Okay. Yeah. So they were doing all right. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a, <laughs> I was going to say a respectable business. No, it's not that. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a business. It's a sustainable business, right. I guess, is, is the way to put it. Um, I guess the other thing that strikes me about this is that it seems as though these folks were in the reach of Western law enforcement. Yeah. So think about all the people who are up to this sort of thing who are not within the reach of Western right. law enforcement. Uh, you know, the usual suspects. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Russian um, countries, uh, folks in China, and so on and so forth. North Nigeria, Korea, India. Yeah, the the usual places. But, you know, good news. I mean, I, I think if something like this can, can cause the folks who are considering doing this to think twice or have them looking over their shoulders, you know, I think this is a good effort. So I, I, I applaud Europol and the rest of the law enforcement agencies who are involved with this. And That's hopefully... It makes a dent in uh, this kind of thing. I hope it does. Yeah. All right. That is my story this week. Joe, what do you have for us? Dave, my story is not good news, like I said earlier. My story is, <laughs> oh, no. frankly, just awful. Okay. Uh, and this story was sent to me by uh, by Euclid on LinkedIn. And then Brandian also sent it in to our through our web portal, I think. Okay. Uh, sent us an email somehow. Anyway, um, it is about a, a woman named Lolita Hall. Mm -hmm. She was shot and killed by a scamming victim. Hmm. Uh, so this guy shot her when she showed up to her house, or his house, rather, uh, thinking that he, that that Miss Hall was part of the 
uh, the scammers network. Okay. Can, but, can we, so let's back up a okay. step. What what did, can you can you walk us through? Like tell us the tale of what yes. was going on here. So what happened is this eighty one year old man named William Brock. Okay. Uh, has been getting fraudulent phone calls from scammers demanding money, and uh, they were threatening him for weeks leading up to this event. Okay. And then on the day of the shooting, one of them called him, telling him that a relative was in jail, and they demanded money from him, and then placed an order via Uber for someone to collect a package from his house. Oh. Right? Uh, Miss Hall accepted the Uber job Okay. As an Uber driver. Okay. And when she got there, Mr. Brock thought this is one of the scammers, uh, pulled out a gun and an altercation ensued and, and Miss Hall is now dead. Ugh. And and uh Mr. Brock is now facing murder charges. Yeah. This is terrible all around. There is no good outcome here for anybody involved. Hmm. Um but I wanted to talk more about the uh, inner workings of how this happened. If you want to go out and read this the story, uh, you can see it online. It, it's a tough read. Okay. It's, it's not easy to get through the story. Uh, but really, what is happening here is that it's only possible because of this product from Uber called, uh, called Uber Connect. Okay. Uh, Uber Connect is essentially using Uber as a courier service. Right. So Uber started as just having taxi service from one place to the next. Then they did Uber Eats. Right. And now they're also doing Uber Connect. Okay. Right. Which I guess it's a good, you know, it's a good adjacent market for them to move into. Sure. But, you know, I have a friend who's an Uber driver. Okay. And before the show, I called him and I, I told him I was going to talk about this story on the show. And I asked him if it's okay if I ask him about this and tell him. I, you know, he gave me some insights okay. that I'm free to share, I should right. say. Uh, and I said, do you, do you use Uber Connect? Do you do Uber Connect for any of your rides? He says, no, I don't. But one time, somebody summoned uh, me as an Uber X, which is just a, a guy with a car that drives around, right? Yeah. Um, and I showed up and somebody just put a package in the back of my car and they said, see you later. And I was like, aren't I supposed to take somebody? He said, no, you're supposed to take this package. And he says, I got an order for an UberX, which means I'm supposed to give someone a ride. And they said, well, can you deliver the package? So he delivers the package. Right. Right. And he, and he, he says he's going to this, this, uh, this place and he decides to himself, if he gets into the parking lot of this place and there's no one around, he's just leaving. But as soon as he gets in the parking lot, there's someone there waiting for him. They open the door. They take the package out. They say, sorry about the confusion. I didn't mean to order an UberX. I meant to order an Uber Connect. Okay. Uh, and he takes the package and he leaves. His next Uber rider and the next two Uber riders after that are on the phone with people. And he overhears them saying something about s the smell of weed. <laughs> in the in the car. In the car. <laughs> okay. Gee, I wonder what was in the box, right. Joe. <laughs> so he gets out. Sure enough, the back of his car reeks like weed. He had to get uh he had to get it cleaned out. It took two days for the smell to dissipate. Okay. So essentially, it looks like Uber Connect is just Uber's drug running service. <laughs> So, I mean... It, well, I mean, not exclusively, but you could see how it would be handy for that. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, huh. we talk about these scams, uh, like, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about a, uh, a the, the place in the Philippines, the scam center in the Philippines, where right. people were essentially enslaved to run these romance scams. Mm -hmm. These are... These kind of situations are no different. When someone shows up at your house to pick up something you're being scammed out of, that's probably not the scammer. No. The scammer's going to send no, somebody... certainly not. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a mule, right? right? I mean, yeah. The scammer's going to send somebody over for exactly the reason to avoid... Of, of avoiding what happened here. Right. Where, uh, you know, unfortunately, Miss Hall did not survive the event. I, I you know, I don't know what the solution here is, aside from people being aware that if you're being scammed, that first off, pulling a gun on somebody who's scamming you is probably not a good idea, to say the yeah, least. Yeah, yeah. Um, the um, Taking but, the law into your own hands is yeah. essentially what Mr. Brock is accused of doing. Right, right. We could have a, we could have a whole 
gun rights debate, but that's not what this is about. Yeah. This is about people being exploited to, as part of this, um, part of this system, this scamming system. And they're, they're, they're exploiting Uber, which I'm not going to say Uber shouldn't have this service. I think this is, I can absolutely see that this is a legitimate service. Sure. Um, but when you're, you know, when you're in the middle of a scam, you've got to think the person you're dealing with may also be a victim. Like mm. I've said before, it could be, it's, it's victims all the way down. Mm. And I don't even know how many layers of insulation there are before you actually get to the person who is the actual evil mastermind behind everything. Right. Uh, before there's somebody who's actually guilty of, of a crime. Well, and I think about, you know, the, again, the, the poor victim of this, yeah. Lalitha Hall, who was the, the woman who was shot and killed, she's just, you know, minding her own business, doing yeah. her job. Trying to make a couple extra bucks. Right. Right. Um, she shows up not knowing that, that Mr. Brock has had this history with these scammers. He's probably fed up. Yeah. Uh, he's been put into a heightened emotional state because the scammers told him that a relative was in jail. Right. So he's probably not in his right mind. You know, let's just, I mean, that's plausible anyway. Yeah. Um, and so Miss Hall walks into an altercation. She wasn't expecting. Obviously, she didn't deserve. No. Um, and it leads to this tragedy. Yeah. It, what it, I wonder is like... Is, does this also speak to a lack of vetting on, say, Uber's point of view? Or is it just the fact of a cost of doing business that sometimes people are going to have you know, a burner phone and a f stolen credit card and they're going to sign up for Uber? Right. And I, I thought about that, too, and that's exactly what I, what I think this situation is. It's a, it's a burner phone and a stolen credit card. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's probably no way to trace this back to an individual. Mm -hmm. There probably isn't a uh, there probably isn't any real information in that Uber account, right? No, it, it's just it's just awful. It is. And you want to say we want to remind people, like like you said, to have empathy for the folks you may cross paths with in the course of a scam. I, but it's also like, did I don't know? Did Mister Brock know that he was being scammed at this point? I, I would say he did. Yeah, uh, although. Who knows? Uh, I think that's what he said to the police as well. Okay. There, there's quotes in, in there about the uh, the sheriffs or the deputies that said he volunteered a bunch of information when they got there. Sure, sure. All right. Well, we will have a link to that story in our show notes. Uh, and again, if there's something you'd like us to consider for the show, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. All right, Joe, we're going to switch gears here, and it is time for our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Robert, who writes, This seems like a scam, but I'm not sure where it would lead. It looks like some other people have gotten an email like this, too, but mostly different URLs. Companies applying to register names... Uh, but interestingly enough, the address seems to be the same in at least the scam I received and a couple of others. Hmm. So, uh, thankfully, Robert only sent us a picture of the email he received. <laughs> it was yeah. not text. So, it's in... Infunity? Infunity, <laughs> Is yeah. that who it's from? It's Infunity? An, I think it's about <clears throat> Infunity. Infunity. All right. Well, it goes like this. Dear Sir, Madam, this email is from China Intellectual Property Office, which mainly deal with Chinese brand name and domain name, etc. Here we have something to confirm with you. A company named Tepta International Limited was applying to register Infunity as its Chinese brand name, some domain names. But after our audit work, we found that the keyword are the same as your company name, because this registration will determine the ownership of the brand name. We need to check with you whether your company has authorized TEPTA International Limited to register the Chinese brand name and those domain name and whether you have dispute about this registrations. If you authorize this, we will finish the registration as per our duty. If you did not authorize, please contact us by email in time so that we will handle this issue better. Thanks for your cooperation. Looking forward to your prompt reply. Best regards, Del Bello Xiao, 
And then it has a phone number uh, and says that uh, he's from somewhere in China. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you make of this? I don't know. <laughs> um, first off, perhaps Infinity is a real domain. That's possible. Yeah. That Robert might own like Infinity.com. I don't know. Um, and maybe we're outing Robert here. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but it could also just be a random string of um, a random string of characters that somebody threw together to try to make something that sounds good. Um, but a lot of this information on domains is public information. Okay, you so I just, just use who is. Uh, I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay. I just went to Infunity.com. Right. It's Information Security Awareness for Beginners. Explore Infunity's content designed to elevate your security posture. Email scam phishing deep dive series. The plan is to release fictional but specific examples of email scams. This is useful for people in the workplace who need to stay safer from email scams. It's still being decided if this will be a free or paid series. If this is a free series, then it may be used to help advertise the online message security analy analysis consulting project that, as of writing, is being worked on. Uh, is, I don't know what's going on here, Joe. Is someone yeah. trying to pull a fast one on us? I have no <laughs> idea. This doesn't make any sense to me. So uh, maybe we'll get some follow-up from Robert or some uh, somebody else knows what's going on. Uh, I would say... Do not respond to this uh, to this email. Mm. Do not respond to this email. Uh, this is almost certainly a scam, um, and there's nothing to stop anybody from registering the same domain name with these uh, two letter top level domains. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, yeah, they don't need your permission to do that anyway. Right, right. If they're in yeah. China, you're here. The you know there's. You have no recourse if they do, so it wouldn't make sense for a Chinese domain authority if if the China Intellectual Property Office even exists. It wouldn't make any sense for them to reach out to you. Right. I don't know. I don't know where this leads if it even is a thing. Um, but uh, I don't know. There's a lot of odd things about this. What I don't know is what Robert's relationship is, if anything, to Infunity. I mean, right. Infunity seems to be some kind of startup that's aiming to do information security awareness. Right. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know. Don't respond. Don't respond. It's only going to try to get more personal, identifiable information out of you and probably ask you for a credit card number to assure that some protective service is installed. It's a racket. Yeah, who knows? Yep. All right. Well, uh, again, we would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to consider for our catch of the day, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. We were talking about making users into an asset for security professionals. Simply put, users want to do the right thing. They're often just lacking the knowledge to do so. That's one of the reasons Know Before has released Security Coach, a real-time security coaching tool that takes alerts from your existing security stack and sends immediate coaching to users who've taken risky actions. For example, imagine a user has visited a high-risk website or tried to open a document containing malware. Existing security tools will likely block that action, but the user might not understand why. Security Coach analyzes these alerts and provides users with relevant security tips via email or Slack, coaching them on why the action they just took was risky. Help users learn from their mistakes and strengthen your organization's security culture with Security Coach. Learn more about Security Coach at knowbefore.com slash securitycoach. That's knowbefore.com slash security coach.
Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Roger Grimes. He is the data-driven defense evangelist at Know Before. We're talking about his new book, Fighting Fishing, Everything You Can Do to Fight Social Engineering and Fishing. Here's my conversation with Roger Grimes. Well, for one, I, I just never have come across a source that literally had everything in one place that someone could use to fight social engineering and fishing. That's really what it came to. You know, for every type of cyber attack, you need to create three major types of defenses. And that is policy things, which is, you know, that's like telling people, make sure you lock your desktop when you walk away. Make sure that you don't give your email away to people that send you an email. You know, that sort of stuff. You have policies that set particular types of expectation and behaviors. Then you have technical defenses, which are things like your firewalls, your content filtering, uh, your antivirus, your endpoint detection and response software, that sort of stuff that that's really great. That's the stuff that where you try to stop bad things from getting to end users. But no matter how great your technical defenses and policies are, there's always some amount of phishing and social engineering that's going to get to the end user. And so they have to be trained to be able to recognize that they're being socially engineered uh, how to appropriately mitigate it, which sometimes is just deleted, other times it's reported, and in a corporate environment, making sure that they certainly report it, you know, appropriately report it so that IT or IT security knows that it's going on. Can you help us kind of level set here? I, I mean, I think for folks uh, like you and me who are kind of in this every day and thinking about it and talking about it, we have a certain level of awareness. But you know, for someone who's not at all in cybersecurity, just, you know, doing their day-to-day work uh, at their job, using their work computer, that sort of thing. Where's their head when it comes to this kind of stuff? Is is this on most people's radar? You know, I, I think everybody's aware of social engineering and phishing. I think most people aren't aware that it's, it's uh, social engineering and phishing is involved in 70 to 90% of all successful data breaches. So I think people are aware of it. They certainly, you know, you're getting those weird texts to your phone. You're getting scam phone calls, you know, trying to offer you maybe a, a car warranty or something like that. You're seeing the emails. You're seeing seeing the weird website things that tell you maybe that you need to update your software when you know that you already have. So I think everybody's kind of aware of it, but most people aren't aware of just how important it is. If we literally... Because social engineering and phishing is involved in 70 to 90 percent of all successful data breaches, if we are able to address just that one thing, which is to put down social engineering and phishing, it would get rid of 90, 70 to 90 percent of all cybersecurity risk, just fixing one thing. Do you think that's something that it's realistic to aspire to? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you, I don't think you're going to be able to get rid of it altogether. You know, like it's like saying that you're going to get rid of all crime, <laughs> but I yeah. think you can more appropriately. The, the problem is, is that the average entity doesn't spend 3% of their resources to fight it. And it is that fundamental misalignment that it's the largest method of cyber attacks. And that we literally don't respond in telling people how to recognize it and defeat it that allows it to be so successful for so long. It's been the number one method for over three decades, and it continues to be. We keep treating it like it's part of the problem when it really is the majority of the problem. Nothing else is even close. The thing that comes in next best as far as causing the largest number of cyber attacks is patching and are are having unpatched software and firmware. And that's responsible or involved in about 20 to 40% of attacks. And social engineering and unpatched software oftentimes go together. Those two things together, fighting social engineering, patching your software and your firmware, if more companies did them, it would get rid of 90 to 99% of the risk that most organizations face. But yet altogether, most organizations don't spend 5% of their budget to fight it. And like for social engineering, they don't spend 3% of their budget. And then they wonder, like they throw their hands up going, well, we can't beat it. There's always going to be somebody in our company that can be social engineered. Well, I'm not sure if that's true if you're spending something more than 3% of your budget to fight the number one problem by far. Hmm. 
How do you recommend that organizations dial in the, the various tools they have at their disposals here? I mean, we talk about policies, education, and then technical strategies. How do they go about turning those knobs? Well, uh, you know, I think first you have to communicate to senior management that social engineering and phishing is the number one problem by far, so they can free you up to make resource decisions, to buy the right things, to have the right policies, to get, get the right amount of education. Most companies in this world don't even educate people to fighting social engineering, and the ones that do that actually have a security awareness training program only do training once a year, which is the, you know, the same as almost not doing it. The reality is you need to have it far more frequently, like one, at least training once a week, simulated phishing campaigns at least once a week. And the nice thing about the simulated phishing campaigns is you train somebody to say, well, you know, you shouldn't do this or do that. And then you can send a simulated phishing test and see who in your organization, you know, already has the education or learn from the education and doesn't click on the phishing test. And then people that do still click on the phishing test they get more immediate training. So that's one of the nice things about simulated phishing is that you can immediately identify the people that need more training and the people that have enough training right now. How do you measure success with a program like this? How do you know that your investment is paying off? I mean, ultimately, it's that, you know, your company doesn't get compromised due to social engineering or phishing. That's really the ultimate goal is that you can say that either we're not compromised or we don't have people clicking on real phishing tests. Uh, You know, so like with our software, you can measure something we call the fish prone rate, which is the the rate at which people will click on a link within a simulated phishing email. Well, when the average company uh, customer comes to us, about a third, sometimes much more, sometimes 40, 50% of their employees will click on a phishing link. I mean, even the, the emails that we craft to do the original kind of base test, the average IT person looks at it and goes, nobody is going to click on that. You know, it's obviously a phishing <laughs> email. Uh, it misspells our company name and still everybody clicks on it. By the time they get uh, the appropriate training and simulated phishing tests, you can get that down easily to 5% versus 30 or 40 or 50%. And, you know, most of our customers that are following what we say, which is monthly training and, and monthly to weekly simulated phishing, they get it down to like one or two or 3%, you know, that, and that's really what we have to do is appropriately focus the right amount of resources in the right places, you know, to put the right defenses in the right places and the right amounts against the right things. And that includes fighting social engineering and phishing. And again, even better patching. Like everybody knows you're supposed to patch. I mean, we've heard all of us know that, but there's a reason why unpatched software and firmware is still involved in about a third uh, to 40% of attacks. And that's because we're actually not concentrating well enough on making sure we do have those patches in a timely manner. And we're just we're just not focusing correctly on the right things and the right amounts to stop it, or else we would do a far better job. Instead, ransomware and other threats run rampant and we throw our hands up and you know people conjure these visions of these uber smart hackers and you know you'll never be able to keep them out. That's not so much the problem is we're not doing the basic things that we've known we've had to do for three decades. We're just not doing them well enough. It's almost like we're not even trying at times. Hmm. You know, certainly uh, generative AI has caught everyone's imagination. And and I'm wondering, from your perspective, how has this changed the game, if at all? Or are you seeing the, the phishing campaigns growing more sophisticated? Or where are we with that? Yeah, for sure, uh, AI has created more realistic phishing and phishing attacks. There are people that are falling to AI-generated social engineering and phishing attacks every day. I think one of the most notable ones recently was this guy that uh, secretly transferred $25 million to these social engineers. because, And the social engineers used AI to generate members of his own team uh, attending a Zoom call to convince them to transfer $25 million. So his team members didn't attend the Zoom call. It was all fake generated. He said he was even suspicious of the request at first, but when he had all of his team members tell him that he needed to do it, he just went and transferred this $25 million. And it it sounds insane, but you know, it just depends on the circumstances and the motivations and stuff. Now, 
my issue with AI, I, I, I think AI is a game changer, paradigm change. It's going to change everything in the world, not even just computers. Everything we do is going to be improved by AI, some assisted AI agent assisting people that help us and create products and stuff like that. It is also sadly going to increase cyber crime. But the question is, we don't really know how much. Like, let me say again that social engineering is already involved in a 70 to 90 percent of all successful data breaches. That's without AI. And now we have AI added. So, what we no one knows is how much worse it's going to make it be. Uh, you know, is it going to make it like, let's suppose that we, cybercrime already is uh, 100 miles tall. Is it going to make it another mile worse or, you know, or another 100 miles worse? We, we don't know. But what I will say this is that AI is going to make cybercrime worse in some percentage. But at the same time, like in social engineering, whether it's AI generated or not, once you're aware that audio and video uh, over the internet and stuff can be faked, the message, when someone's telling you to go, um, you know, make this $25 million, you know, payment that you didn't think you were going to make, well, if you have the right policies, that just can't happen. That person, if you have a certain set of policies that say that there needs to be an appropriate invoice and there has to be accounts payable checks and accounts receivable, and if not, you'll get fired, that person that's being told to make a quote unquote secret $25 million payment is not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mo- most phishing attacks have two traits with them. Uh, uh, mo- let me say most, not all, but the first is that they arrive unexpectedly. You weren't expecting it, and somehow you get a request to do something. And that request is asking you to do something that you've never done before, at least for the requester. And those two traits are going to stay the same for most social engineering and phishing attacks, whether or not it's AI generated or not. What's your advice for folks who are, are looking to better protect their family members? You know, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, for myself, I, I have an elderly father who, uh, as he, you know, slows down in all the age appropriate ways, uh, sometimes I, I can't help thinking that he's kind of a sitting duck out there, you know, for these folks who are targeting uh, folks in his position. Any any advice there? Yeah, well, I mean, so kind of what I've said from the beginning, which is you really need to tell them that most of the hacking is done through social engineering, that you cannot trust anybody, whether they call you, you meet them in person, whether they email you, you message you, you literally have to teach everyone including your loved ones, including your elderly loved ones, that any call, any request uh, from somebody that you don't know personally and and you're not meeting them in person, the rest of it can be fake. The phone can be fake. The internet can be fake. Email can be fake. The SMS call can be fake. The person that sounds like your best friend or your grandchild on the phone, it can be faked. And so you have to educate them about how all of that can be faked, how you can't trust anything remotely. You can't trust a lot of things even in person and to have a healthy level of skepticism. The number one thing you can do is teach yourself, your loved ones, your family, your friends, your coworkers to have this healthy level of skepticism about any request that has those two traits arrives when you weren't expecting it and is asking you to do something strange that you've never been asked to do before, at least for that requester. And if you can communicate that, that, hey, there's all this fraud out there, there's all these people that can fake being other people, you can't even trust if it's my voice, if it arrives unexpectedly and it's asking you to do something that you've never done before, at least try to verify it using some other method that you trust more before you perform that action. Joe, what do you think? Dave, I like one of the first things he talks about here is that for every threat, you need three types of defenses. Uh, And I would say this is generally across the board with everything. You need these. You need policy defenses. Mm -hmm. You need tech defenses. And you need defenses for your people. And the best way to do that is training. Yeah. Um, Something we frequently forget as cybersecurity practitioners is that not everybody lives and breathes this stuff like we do. They're not (laughs) steeped in it every day. Right. They're just trying to get their jobs done. Now, that being said, that is kind of the reason that, as Roger points out, 
70 to 90% of the successful breaches have some social engineering element. Yeah. Uh, so if we could fix that part of the problem, we could easily stop the majority of breaches, right? If you think about the, the uh, cybersecurity or the, uh, the cyber kill chain, right? Right. You know, you, they, they, everybody likes to say, we have to be right all the time and the bad guys only have to be right once. No, they don't have to be right once. They have to do a bunch of different stuff to win, to win, the, win the fight, to get inside. And there's a lot of different opportunities along that path to stop them. And of course, if you can stop them at the social engineering uh, part of the attack, then you can eliminate 70 to 90 percent of your um, of your attacks. Now, <laughs> that's simple, and it is that, it is that simple, but it's not that easy, right? <laughs> right. That's there. Those are two different things. A simple solution is not necessarily an easy solution. Right. So uh, Roger makes an excellent point that. Uh, that here that we keep treating this like it's part of the problem but the the fact is that social engineering is the majority of the problem mm. it is the biggest single component that's present in in the or it's it's i should say it's the component that's present in the most number of attacks mm-hmm. the second most number he points this out the second biggest thing in that's present in the most number of attacks is uh patching you know, patch management failures. Right. And that comes in at like 20 to 40%. So like well below half. And we're not spending enough security budget on security awareness training to know what this looks like, to know what social engineering attacks look like. And I agree 100% with Roger. I say he, I say this frequently in my talks that training once a year is almost as good as not doing it at all. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, there, you are definitely checking a box to comply with something, right? <laughs> in my opinion. You need to be doing this training much more often. And the reason you need to be doing that training much more often is because you need to think about how people remember things and what time, the time horizon of the last time you trained them. If that last training was like six months ago, that's not in, in anybody's head anymore. Yeah, it has it's, to stay it, top of mind. It's gone. Yeah. But if you keep it in front of them every month or every two weeks or every week, and it doesn't have to be a big time suck every time you do it. It can be small little increments every single time uh, that can add up to about the same time they would spend in the in the annual briefing. Mm-hmm. So think about that. Um, you can you can absolutely measure your the success of your program and and companies like know before who is our sponsor by the way uh and have have these ways that you can you can see how well you're doing and it's interesting that the more frequent you're training the better your results are the more uh resistant to the attacks your your people get that's kind of just saying that the data says what i just said yeah right <laughs> <laughs> um but truly the best measure of success is nothing happening which is, mm-hmm. again, part of the big problem in cybersecurity is yeah. that when we're successful, nothing happens. Right. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> we spent all this money and nothing happened. Yep, you're yeah. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> right. You didn't have to get on CNN and explain anything this year. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's the way you, you spin it. Um, it all comes back to the basics, though. You know, we're still talking about security awareness and, and patch management. You know, it's still still a lot of companies are not doing these two things, and and there are other things you can do as well, um, that are that are essentially very basic. That I think that that just gets lost in the weeds. We all like to look at the new shiny product, right? <laughs> the yeah, one with all the lights and the bells and the whistles. Um, what do you do to uh, how do you, how do you communicate this? How do you have um, how do you protect people in the office and even people who are not in the office? And I think Roger has an excellent summation here where he talks about a healthy dose of skepticism whenever you see a communication that has two traits. And he makes it very simple with just two traits. He says, you're not expecting the communication and it's an unusual request. Yeah. If you're not expecting this unusual request, then it's probably a scam. Right, right. Be big old alarm bells going yeah. off. Right? You should be like, slow down. <laughs> right. We're Ooga, not going. Ooga. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, our thanks to Roger Grimes for joining us. Again, his new book is titled Fighting Fishing, Everything You Can Do to Fight Social Engineering and Fishing. We do appreciate him taking the time. We 
want to thank all of you for listening, and of course, we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are experts in helping users do the right thing through new school security awareness training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Our thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producers are Jennifer Iben and Brandon Karp. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.